Chair, the Dean of Libraries here at Baylor University. Uh, on behalf of Kathy Hillman, uh, who is the director of the Keston Center for Religion, Politics, and Society at Baylor University, and the Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies at the University of Notre Dame, welcome to Afghanistan, the next chapter. The Keston Center partners with the Keston Institute in the UK to be a voice of the voiceless in the fight for religious freedom by preserving resources, promoting research, disseminating information, and hosting events such as today's panel. What I'd also like to add is that what better way to fulfill Baylor's mission, which is the mission of Baylor University is to educate men and women for worldwide leadership and service by integrating academic excellence and Christian commitment within a caring community. How can we prepare our students and even our faculty for worldwide service if we're not bringing the world to them on very critical issues such as this? Thank you. Uh, and now moderator Charles Ramsey serves as associate chaplain and lecturer in Baylor's history department where he teaches introduction to Islam and world religion among other courses. Dr. Ramsey is also a senior fellow, South and Southeast Asia and Middle East action teams with the Religious Freedom Institute. Welcome. Good afternoon and welcome to Afghanistan, the next chapter, a uh, panel conversation, as you just heard, the Keston Center for Religion, Politics and Society at Baylor, co-hosted with the uh, Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies at the University of Notre Dame. Uh, I am Charles Ramsey and I'm happy to be your moderator today. First, I'd like to express thanks uh, to those who have made this event possible today. Namely, and I want to say first and foremost, Professor Kathy Hillman, who is the director of the Keston Center, uh, for seeing the importance of such events. Uh, also to Carl Flynn for the work in bringing us together. And of course, uh, Dean Jeffrey Archer, Dean of the Baylor Libraries for support. Uh, thank you also to uh, uh, Arif Dostiar. I'm looking at the screen to see him and Hannah uh, Heisenker at Notre Dame. I also like to thank Eric Patterson and Jeremy Barker and Lena Abood at the Religious Freedom Institute. Uh, for their support uh, for my research and travel to Afghanistan this past May. So I was there just uh, really about two and a half months ago. And if you would like to read a report and, and just experience from my travel there, that is on the website uh, where you signed in for this. You can download it and you can read about that. Uh, I want to welcome you all to be here today, both those who are in person and those who are online. We're reminded, I think, even by this experience, uh, by your interest and by your attendance, that, that this is a global nature and conversation. This is a global uh, conversation. We welcome you, and we'll have time for questions and comments in the end. So we would like to hear for you from you. Okay, we're honored to convene this panel. Uh, we really have a distinguished <clears throat> group of experts. We're drawing from their experience and success. Last year, we did this as well. It was called Facing Forward Afghanistan After America, and we set out excuse me, to host a gathering with the purpose of hearing uh, Afghan voices on the current situation and their reflections uh, on the events of this past year and to look forward to, uh, to what might be up around the bend. Now, we are tremendously pleased by the constituents of our panel, the depth of their professional experience and expertise, and also the range and diversity they represent. Uh, first, Professor Dr. Qasim Wafayazada now at Kunazawa University in Japan. So it is very early in the morning there. Thank you, Professor, for being with us. He served as the uh, National Minister of Information and Culture, uh, and he's a senior le uh, leader in the elected regime, but also a representative of the Shia and Hazara community, some of those who've experienced the brunt of discrimination and ethno-religious violence. We're also joined by Mr. Aref Dostiar, uh, who's the National Security Advisor, for the, the again, in the pre previous regime, the president of Afghanistan was a consul general for the Western United States during the political transition last year. Uh, and now he's a senior advisor there at Notre Dame. And of course, last but not least at all, Pawasha Kakar, who laid the Gender Studies Institute at Kabul University. So great expertise there. And now the interim 
Director for Religion and Inclusive Societies at the U.S. Institute of Peace in Washington, D.C. Uh, this truly is an exceptional panel of experts. And again, we express our thanks and appreciation for your joining us in this forum. Let me provide a brief word of introduction uh, to these proceedings. Now, many of us watched in dismay some 15 months ago as the provincial capitals uh, fell to Taliban forces in rapid succession. So that was summer of 2021. Now there's been an overwhelming sense of loss and lament, uh, sorrow for the loss and suffering that has affected so many lives. A lament for the dire circumstances today where many face hunger, loss of opportunity in education and employment, and the continued uncertainty experienced in the absence of a positive peace. That is a peace forged through cooperation and a shared vision for where we go from here. So today we give voice to this lament, and yet, uh, as seen in the title of our, of our panel, we know that this is not the end of the story. There is a next chapter, and today we also give voice to the hope for a better future, one shared by us all, and one expressed to me over and over again by Afghan friends who remain steadfast in hope for a better day. So as is the Baylor tradition, and as your host, let us begin by taking a few minutes in silent meditation and prayer to express our lament and to honor those who have served and given of themselves. And it is likely that all of us here today and all of us joining online as well know someone who has been personally impacted by the war. So let us honor their sacrifice, particularly as we cultivate a hope for this next chapter. Please join me in silence, and then we will begin. Thank you. We would like to begin our panel now by inviting uh, Professor Dr. Mkasim Wafayazada to make his remarks. Thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you, Professor. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I assume uh, it's afternoon there. Uh, let me first express my gratitude to the Kirsten Center for Religion, Politics, and Society at Baylor University, and especially. Professor Charles Ramsey for arranging this panel discussion on Afghanistan. It's an honor to join my colleagues, uh, Mr. Arif Dostyar, Ms. Palwasha Kakar, and Professor Ramsey uh, in this panel. As an Afghan, I feel uh, so disappointed when I see that history repeats itself in Afghanistan and the dark forces of terror twist the fate of my country in the ugliest way. Further disappointment comes when I see that there is no agenda for Afghanistan on the part of the international community and the people's suffering is ignored. For most, Afghanistan is thought to be a lost cause and nobody wants anything more to do with it. But for Afghans, their lives, their liberties and human rights are at stake. The fight for constitutional order, democracy, enshrining human rights, freedom of expression and association continues. Those who have been following the news on Afghanistan see women demonstrating in Kabul and other cities, brave young women standing face to face with Taliban forces, girls pressing their demand for reopening of schools, and a young educated gener generation in Eastern Afghanistan rallying and carrying the fallen flag of their country. These activities represent the social dynamism of Afghan society, which is more complex than we think and more vibrant than we perceive. Neither the Taliban nor the few corrupt people who led the country to the disastrous collapse can represent the dynamic, multicultural, and diverse social landscape of Afghanistan. You know, to be honest, we suffered from a weak leadership who was unable to navigate the country through the turbulent situation, to manage, to manage it effectively in the face of rapidly unfolding events, 
it failed to balance domestic and foreign policies, rally support from our international allies, as well as all ethnic groups and social clivers within the country. Has they failed to salvage the country from a relapse to the dark reign of terror. Yet the US played an equally negative role at signing of the Doha Agreement in 2020, which I call a pact with the devil, abandoned Afghanistan after years of joint efforts and joint investment of blood and money. The journey we started in 2001 for democratization, state building and nation building in the collective endeavors for cultivating democratic values has not been in vain. Only it has lost its political expression and institutional foundation and constitutional support by the collapse of the Islamic Republic on August 15, 2021. Within the society, the desire for peace, security, justice and liberty is stronger than ever. This fervent desire continues to challenge the traditionalist forces of the Taliban and needs to be recognized. Today, Afghanistan is in the grip of the darkest forces in the region. The Taliban, since their return to power, has abolished the constitution and continue to reject any sort of participatory politics and constitutional order. They preach democracy as the evil of the West. The Taliban have imposed a strict Sharia law, in, which is intolerant of free media and political and civil activities. The Taliban government is symbolized by imposition of gender apartheid, gender segregation, and brutal suppression of any social or individual objection. Prior to the collapse of the government, many observers had invested uh, their hopes in a changed and much moderate Taliban, assuming them to have learned from their past mistakes. They suggested that once the Taliban ascended to a ruling position, the network of terrorists would transform automatically and smoothly into a system of governance. But as is now self-evident, the Taliban has only grown more brutal and more assertive in their fundamentalist approach. The Tal Taliban instrumentalizes ethnic sentiments and inside hatred among Afghanistan's multiple ethnic groups. For the most vulnerable ethnic and religious minorities, it has been totally catastrophic. For example, Afghanistan once home to uh, nearly 200,000 Sikhs. You know, on August 13, Afghan Sikh leader, Gurnam Singh told the Economic Times of India that only 100 Sikh had remained in Afghanistan who were also planned to be evacuated. Before that, Zablon Sementov, Afghanistan's last Jewish citizen, has, was evacuated in September 2021. The Kyrgyz minority of about 1,500 people in the four northeastern Pamil corridor are set to be transferred to Kyrgyzstan by 2024. Afghanistan once home to 55 ethnic groups speaking 45 languages based on Summer Linguistics Institute, Institute is losing its cultural diversity. In the absence of a constitution that would enshrine and ensure equal rights and access to all ethno-linguistic or religious groups, the Taliban is imposing a cultural monopoly by continued discrimination against and targeted attacks on minority groups. Hazaras, a religious and ethnic minority in one of the four major ethnic groups of Afghanistan, including Pashtuns, Tajiks, and Uzbeks, has also faced a much deteriorated situation since the return of the Taliban to power. ISIS-K increasingly attacks Hazaras, Hazaras schools, mosques, cultural centers, and target Hazaras in open streets and shopping centers. The Taliban, while failing to ensure their security, has continued their own repressive policies toward the Hazaras. These include persecution, driving them out of their lands, and denying them all political and religious rights. This unprecedented wave of targeted attacks has been documented by several domestic and international organizations. 
The UK House of Commons and House of Lords in a joint report in August stated that Hazaras were at serious risk of genocide at the hands of the Taliban and ISIS-K. Tajik's resistance against the Taliban has turned into an excuse for summary persecutions and ex executions, illegal detentions, and a witch hunt in Kabul and other Tajik dwelling areas. There are even reports of gang rapes and forced marriage to Taliban rank and file as a punitive measure, which needs to be verified. Uzbeks and Turkmen's has suffered similar levels of persecutions and violation of their rights. In sum, the Taliban has rolled back every bit of achievement we were able to make in the past two decades. Today, based on the UN reports, half of the Afghan population are struggling with extreme poverty and many with hunger. The economy has collapsed. Administration is not functioning to deliver services to the public. The Taliban's prime minister reacting to the humanitarian crisis in the country in his first message to the media stated that the Taliban were not responsible for the deteriorating situation, nor obligated to provide solution for the people. Rather, he said the catastrophic condition or a divine test and the people should ask and pray to the almighty Allah for relief. Now the question is, where do we stand with respect to Afghanistan's future? Certainly the status quo is not desirable for Afghans, nor the international community, nor feasible to maintain for the Taliban. So the, the current situation is an impossible state and change is unavoidable in the long run. Afghanistan is swiftly turning into a safe haven for international terrorism, threatening international security once again. The killing of al-Zawahiri in Kabul should have proved that. For us to reclaim our future, we need to tackle the present challenge. There are two simply, there are simply two options to drive the change. First, war, and second, negotiation. For the first option, Afghanistan has suffered the consequences of war and violence for over four decades, and I think no one should desire more of that but it can be seen as more desirable than the status quo out of desperation. As it is said, desperate times requires desperate measures. Therefore, resumption of intra-Afghan dialogue for a negotiated political settlement is the ideal way of the current quandary out of uh, the current quandary in Afghanistan. Such talks should focus on establishing inclusive government, return of a constitutional order, respect of human rights, effective separation of powers and equal rights and duties of all citizens. An important basis for this is the infamous Doha agreement signed by the Taliban and the US in 2020 that emphasizes a new post-settlement Afghan Islamic government as determined by the intra-Afghan dialogue and negotiations. Given the current circumstances, uh, intra-Afghan dialogue should be held under the auspices of the UN with earnest and strong support from the international community and the US. It is time for the Afghans and the international community to set a new agenda for, Af for, for peace, reconciliation, and inclusion in Afghanistan and to coordinate all domestic, regional, and international efforts for reaching a settlement that would open a new chapter for Afghanistan. Otherwise, there will be no new chapter, no next chapter, but the vicious cycle of violence repeating itself in various ways. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor uh, Qasim Wafayazada. We would like to now hear to hear from Mr. Aref Dostyar, if you would uh, please bring your comments. Salam and greetings. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Ramzi, for organizing today's event. I also want to thank uh, Taylor University's Keystone Center for your commitment uh, to Afghanistan. Professor Ramsey, I know you have been working with Afghans for more than a decade, and so I really appreciate your sustained efforts. And I'm really glad to see um, uh, my colleagues, Dr. Sebko Faizada and Mrs. Kokar. Um, a couple of days ago, uh, I had a conversation um, as I speak with um, 
uh, people, family, friends on the ground uh, regularly. Um, uh, one of my friends who is um, highly educated, he's a lecturer at the university, and uh, he has always believed in a brighter tomorrow. Uh, he told me something that I would like to share with you. He said, we have endured wars. We have lived through natural disasters, but how can we survive despair? His reaction to the situation inside Afghanistan that Dr. Wafaizwada described is telling, and it represents the viewpoint of millions of our people. So please allow me to amplify what I hear from people on the ground. And I took away three messages um, from this encounter um, with my friend. Number one is this change that has taken place in our country is more painful than wars, more painful than natural disasters, because this change did not stop, but it's causing and escalating multiple calamities. The change includes, as Dr. Seb also shared very clearly, social repression and exclusion. Imagine if your daughters get banned from getting an education beyond grade six. Or imagine if you are turned away from work because of your gender. This is the harsh reality right now. Widespread political violence. There are numerous reports of enforced displacements, forcing people out of their homes and occupying them, detaining civilians, torturing and publicly executing detainees. And we see these reports every day. Weekend in state institutions are unable to provide basic services to the people. And as mentioned, there is a worsened humanitarian crisis that has left almost half of or more than half of the population in acute food insecurity. And so all of these are conditions uh, for a renewed armed conflict. And it's a foggy tunnel toward the next chapter toward the future. The second point I took out of this encounter is that the collapse of the Afghan government, the former, and subsequent developments under a Taliban regime have made it hard for our people to make sense of the situation. I think when sense-making becomes too difficult, we face despair. Our people feel alone and forgotten. An Afghan woman speaking at the UN the other day described her situation as being erased from the society. And the last point is in the face of it all, our people are asking how to survive this moment of despair. I see hope behind that question. So many challenges are hiding the opportunities and so many gaps are covering our strengths. Now, what has been the response from the international community and what should be done as we move forward? The world seems to be confused. There seems to be a policy, a season of policy drought for Afghanistan. Priorities in the international community essentially include three things. Number one is counterterrorism. Number two is resettlement of Afghan refugees. Number three is humanitarian aid. And of course, these are all important. They are all urgent. And so are human rights, health, education, and the list can go on. So we Afghans and the international stakeholders must do more to ensure that we get out of a cycle of urgency. Aid is not going to stabilize the humanitarian crisis or address the human rights abuses. Because the conditions on the ground, as I explained earlier, are creating the momentum toward a full-fledged armed conflict. In fact, it may even be called a war by now because the numbers we hear from the sites are more than a thousand battlefield deaths in the past one year, which is part of the definition for a war. The Taliban came to power illegally and I think Everybody, most factions, most sides and in the international community um, agrees with that. 
but still they had and they still have the option to dialogue with other factions. Instead, they have chosen to force others into silence. But what we need to do right now, as we move forward, as also Dr. said mentioned, is create the conditions for some type of a renewed political process. And the objective is to prevent further escalation and settle the conflict. That's what we need to do. We do not need another armed conflict. Unfortunately, that's the momentum right now. What we have to do is create the conditions and ask what those conditions are and how we can get there. Um, and I close with two uh, recommendations. One is for the international community, the United Nations and the US and other um, uh, countries in the global community to balance the scales of engagement and include other factions in their dealing with Afghanistan. After all, if we want an inclusive government in Afghanistan, then we need to have an inclusive engagement with the country. And um, for Afghans, the departure point is to conduct a sustained series of perhaps multiple dialogues with people inside and outside the country. And the objective here is to create a vision for the future of Afghanistan. We need to know what is it that we want and work for it. Um, and develop the steps and goals to achieve it. I will stop here and I'm happy to continue later. Thank you again, Professor. Thank you, Mr. Arif Dostyar. Uh, we'd like to now hear from Mrs. Bawasha Kakar from the United States Institute of Peace. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be with all of you. Um, thank you so much, uh, Professor Ramsey, for this opportunity to speak. Um, on Afghanistan and women, women's rights, which is an issue near and dear to my heart um, and something that I've been working on for quite a long time uh, at the intersection of both women and peace building and religion. As I come to this as the director of the Religion and Inclusive Societies team here at USIP, which by the way, is the longest running, continuous running thematic at USIP. So we have a long history of doing this work here. Mm. Um, I also want to thank Baylor University for hosting us and Notre Dame's Croc Center, and I'm so delighted to be on the panel with Minister Professor Wafaizada and um, esteemed colleague um, Arif Dostia. Uh, so basically what I'd like to do is give an overview of the Taliban decrees to date related to women's rights. Um, talk a little bit about the internal differences and the positive impact and negative impact, the double speak that we've seen, uh, understanding some of the distrust and the responsiveness to constituencies, um, and then get to some of the uh, community level issues and what we hope to achieve with some of our work that we're doing. So what have the Taliban really taken away from women and girls since coming to power last year? Uh, well, if we start with the legal rights and protections, the Constitution is no longer functioning. Uh, family law, uh, as it was under the Republic, the laws are no longer being applied. The specific law of elimination of violence against women is no longer being applied. And the National Action Plan for the implementation of UN Resolution 1325 is no longer being applied. Uh, in terms of education, more than 3 million girls are out of school. Uh, 68,000 women teachers and university lecturers are out of jobs. Tens of thousands of students who are in science, law, arts, engineering, and technology in universities, uh, those female students are now no longer able to study. In terms of employment, there's 6,000 uh, that served as judges, prosecutors, defense lawyers, who are out of jobs, over a thousand uh, journalists, uh, more than a thousand business women, uh, uh, small and medium businesses who are run by women that created more than 77,000 jobs and invested 70 million US dollars into the economy are no longer there. 
uh, as well as high level women, like the 18 women who served as ministers or deputy ministers, the ambassadors and the legislators, those that are in parliament. In terms of media, there's no longer freedom of expression. We had a, a very vibrant uh, and relatively independent media with over 250 radio stations, for example, many led by women, but uh, at least all uh, employed women, almost all are all employed women in some form or another. So we saw these series of decrees that were implemented uh, by the Taliban, these decrees, orders, and edicts. Um, as soon as they declared themselves Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan, they uh, carried out house-to-house -house searches in August of 2021, looking for journalists and individuals with ties to the Republic and Western forces. They put a ban on music in public, and they ordered imams to bring them lists of unmarried girls between the ages of 12 and 45 for their fighters to marry. Uh, and as Professor Ofizada had mentioned, some of these turned into forced marriages uh, as well as abductions. Um, in the September of 2021, after they announced the caretaker government, um, there was uh, the Ministry of Women's Affairs was replaced with the Ministry of Vice and Virtue. Um, shopkeepers were ordered to deface their mannequins and stores and women who were working professional women were told to stay home until further notice. And then women were also banned from attending and teaching Kabul University. Uh, if we uh, fast forward to December of 2021, uh, there was a special decree uh, by the Amir Haibatullah about women's rights. And on top of the special decree that talked about uh, women not as property and trying to say that they need to, to be noble and free, there was then a ban on long distance road trips for women and the vice and virtue order said that women traveling more than 72 kilometers should be accompanied by mahram and that became increasingly more limiting to women. Let me tell you a quick example. Um, some women who are traveling to work who were working uh, with my brother's company uh, their car was stopped multiple times and they were asked where they were going. When they told they were going to work in the early days, they were allowed. Later on, um, they were told that they were not allowed without uh, mahram. Uh, uh, taxi companies uh, who were traveling with women unaccompanied, the drivers were beaten often if they had women with them unaccompanied and were no longer to take women uh, in their vehicles. So this was increasingly more restricting, although we started out saying it's only for longer trips. Um, and uh, you know, other things in terms of having women passengers and playing music was also uh, a cause where they would beat the drivers. Um, the, uh, in the December, also the election commission, the Ministry of Peace and the Ministry of Parliamentary Affairs was dissolved. Uh, in January of 2022, we saw that women were no longer uh, allowed to be in shops without a company by Mahram, and the shop owners were then blamed if they didn't um, bring in, if they, if they served women who were not accompanied by a, a male relative. Um, we saw that uh, in February 22, there was more restrictions on universities to enforce gender segregation in classrooms, even in private universities. And NGOs had to replace members uh, where women were living outside of the country, but um, leading their NGOs, they were asked to replace the board members or, or else they would face shutdown. Um, so then we fast forward to March, and that is when we heard that the girls' schools would not be open from grade seven and up. And we saw so many girls in the streets uh, uh, wanting to go to school and being turned away from their schools and crying uh, and their fathers standing up for them. Uh, what was very interesting to see, and I think uh, is unique in many cases is to see how the fathers in Afghanistan have stood up for their daughters, both publicly in protest and uh, in, in the media for the rights of their daughters to go to school. Um, Recently in Paktia, uh, there were uh, men and fathers who were protesting the, the girls' schools uh, being closed. They had negotiated the opening and then they were reclosed once it got into the media. And I'll get into that a little bit later. 
Um, we also saw that um, there was the Amir uh, order that women employees in offices must not leave the home. And uh, we saw continual restrictions uh, on this. Um, uh, there, there are a number of things that in terms of broadcasting that were also limited. Uh, we saw uh, foreign uh, TV series being limited, especially those that were depicting different uh, ways that women um, had roles in society. Um, in April, there was the announcement of three of three days of a week for women and three days for men in universities. Um, but again, there were all kinds of restrictions that were then uh, uh, enforced. In May 2020, female TV presenters on the air were ordered to cover their faces. Um, they stopped issuing driver's licenses to women, and they issued an order that women were not allowed to use public transport if they were alone. Uh, there was all kinds of uh, issues about what is a proper hijab and how to wear a proper hijab uh, and trying to enforce what is proper hijab according to the Taliban in public. Um, in June 2020, the vice and virtue ordered public transportation drivers to install curtains in the front and the middle of the buses to separate women from the driver and in the front and the men in the back of the bus. And uh, interesting things locally in Ghazni, female students from the grades four to six were ordered to cover their faces while they were commuting commuting to school or face expulsion. Uh, so, so some of the local things were happening differently in terms of how they're implementing. And then the Taliban held all male gathering of 4,500 clerics and leaders in Kabul. And the Taliban claimed that men can sufficiently represent the views of women. Um, in July, they banned women from going to parks. Um, the Taliban told women employees of the Ministry of Finance that each woman should send a male relative to be in the workplace to replace them, rather than them coming and recognizing their expertise. Um, the Vice and Virtue Department began to implement mandatory religious courses in government offices as well uh, after they started this. And then last month, recently in August 2022, they dismissed flight attendants from Ariana Airline saying that women are not allowed to travel without a mahram. Um, they removed the uh, Muharram public holiday, and that has a religious significance to the Shia Muslims from the Afghan calendar, and, and instead declared August 15 as a public holiday to mark their own victory. Um, and they verbally told female employees in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs who've been going in to sign their timesheets once a month but to sign them at the gate and not speak with male employees of the minister of the ministry. And finally, in an interesting move, they announced the establishment of the Department of Vice and Virtue led by women to guide women about their religious duties uh, and to control uh, their religious express expression in that sense. So we see what it means on the day to day that for young women who are going to school between the ages of seven and 12, they are unable to attend schools um, in universities. Some are allowed, some are not allowed. There's all kinds of ways that some days they are turned away from the door. Some days it's more restricted and, and many have given up. Um, we've seen uh, how difficult it is for them to even go anywhere outside of the home because public transportation issues, how to even go to the bazaar to go shopping is difficult because of how the shopkeepers will be treated if they interact with them. Uh, so on a day to day, there are all of these issues that women are dealing with. At the same, uh, in the same sense, in the same vein, I'd like to say that although there are these decrees, um, there's also a range of ways in which uh, it is being implemented. And so you see in different areas that there's more st strict implementation and other areas where there's less strict implementation, particularly where the uh, Afghan public have been pushing back, have been demonstrating, the elders have gone to speak with the local Taliban and have changed things. Uh, so we see that in a number of provinces there are some girls schools that are open and high schools that are open because the community has been able to negotiate that locally. Um, but as I mentioned, 
uh, as soon as this becomes too public, then it looks bad on the Taliban because they're not enforcing their decree in Paktia. Unfortunately, the girls' schools were reclosed after um, a week and a half of being open. So this is a, 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 a give and take that has been very uh, difficult where local communities are trying to negotiate uh, various boundaries and where particularly the Kandahar leadership hears about it wants to enforce uh, their views and their decrees. Now, this is different than the past, where in the past, the Taliban decree was blanket across the board and was, was pretty much enforced everywhere, uh, much uh, more um, uh, across the board in very similar ways, whereas now we see this, this difference and this responsiveness to constituencies where it's possible. Um, another example I wanted to give where there's this distrust and responsive, responsiveness to constituencies is um, in a province in the north, I believe it was uh, Kunar, there was a, um, a wedding that was attacked because of music and the groom was killed and many uh, members of the wedding party were killed be because the Taliban attacked them. And the elders of the community went to the Taliban and said, no more, you will not do this. You will not attack wedding parties. Otherwise we will rebel against you and will not allow you to stay in power. And the Taliban coalesced and have stayed away from uh, wedding parties. So there is that give and take. Um, like I said, with the girls' schools, there's been this negotiation. There's been negotiation with local businesses to allow women's work, but very quietly. They've been told, don't tell the media, don't tell anybody that we're allowing this. It's very quiet. So you see these kinds of local um, negotiations happening. Uh, and the response- interject, if, if I may, just for the sake of time, uh, uh, please finish your statement, but then I wanna then go to Dr. Kasim for him to respond and to give a comment on what he's experiencing in that and his uh, opportunities and from his community. Great. Yeah, no, I, I would love to hear that. Um, and I also, I'm looking forward to hearing more about the inter the dialogue, the intra-Afghan dialogue. Just to finish uh, very quickly, it's this kind of local negotiation that we see at, a, at that effective local level uh, is something that we would like to support in our work, uh, where we're working with Afghan religious scholars and leaders on women's rights issues um, and, and helping helping them come together with international scholars and civil society so that they can get the word out in terms of messages, in terms of understanding the, where the local level negotiation can happen related to women's rights. But we recognize that it is not one size fits all and that it doesn't always work. Um, but that that's the one place that we're seeing traction and, and movement um, in terms of communities advocating for their rights. So with Thank that, I'd like to end. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Kasim, would you like to carry the conversation forward? Yeah, thank you, uh, Professor. I agree with uh, Ms. Palvasha Cocker. Uh, the Taliban's policy toward women has been especially uh, oppressive and restrictive. Uh, on the part of Hazaras and Shias in Afghanistan to, to say, you know, generally what makes it really difficult uh, to understand the Taliban is that currently religious fatwa has replaced the law. So Afghanistan is, uh, we can define it as a, as, a, uh, as a lawless country. Literally, we don't have any law. So they also has stated frequent and uh, repeatedly that we don't need a constitution or man-made laws. So uh, Islamic Sharia is enough for us. So when it comes to fatwa, so it depends on the individual virtue and morality of those leading the country. So you may, you know, uh, come to a good one, the bad one, or the ugly one. It depends on who is, for example, in Bamiyan, the current governor is trying to uh, uh, leave people to, you know, uh, live their lives and not push them towards rebellion. So he's trying to be good with the people. 
But for example, in Daikundi and Ghazni, people have been suffering more. In Bamiyan, only one of the Taliban former commanders, Mawli Mahdi, he rebelled uh, against the Taliban for not including Hazaras in the, in the leadership or the government of Taliban. So uh, he was uh, killed and his rebellion was suppressed brutally. And there was uh, reports of uh, really you know, extreme uh, exercise of violent methods in Balkhab. Other than that, the main issue now that Hazaras are in, 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 in various parts of the country facing is instrumentalization of the nomad sedentary conflict by Taliban. Because Hazaras are not now standing against Taliban, they are not fighting an armed you know, war or conflict with the Taliban, but the sufferings comes in, uh, mostly in that terms. They are supporting the Kochi nomads. Of course, they has every right to be settled somewhere, but not by driving out the, you know, the sedentary communities, the local communities. This is not only against Hazaras. Days ago, I, 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 I saw you know, videos and reports on how these uh, nomads with support of uh, Taliban, they have driven out the whole village in the northern part of Afghanistan among the Uzbeks and Turkmens. In, in, in Ghazni and in Daikundi and some parts of Bamiyan, we had reports of this, especially in Behsud of Maidan Wardak, where even uh, during the previous government also uh, there were frequent clashes between the nomad and sedentary. But uh, currently, with the support of the Taliban, the nomads are uh, attacking the local the villages while they are heavily armed. And uh, uh, they enjoy the support of the current rulers. So that is cultivation of hatred and widening the gap between the Afghan society. So Taliban are, you know, currently, my understanding is that they are trying to mobilize, uh, you know, somehow Pashtun community and inside somehow Pashtun's ethno-nationalism, which is not serving. Because Afghanistan is a country of, of, of multiple ethnic groups. So that's the home for 55 major and minor ethnic groups that they need to live with each other and find a way to co coexist. Okay. The Taliban are trying to build their narrative on Pashtun ethno-nationalism by, for example, uh, erasing Farsi from you know, the university, uh, university boards or maybe some billboards or uh, giving the primacy to Pashto language, which I'm sure that the Afghan intellectuals, the Afghan you know, Pashtuns, those uh, nationalist Pashtuns who care about their country, they don't agree with that. But Afghanistan has suffered you know, historically from a urban rural division. And every time the overthrown of the governments has been the result of the rebellion of the rural communities. The same as, you know, it's defined in the primitive rebellion. rebellion. Uh, and, 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 and that's the Taliban are ma mainly representing that rural Pashtun communities. So they are trying to combine traditionalism Islamism and, and Pashtun ethno-nationalism somehow to justify their rule and mobilize some support from the Pashtun society. So by manifesting that how they are driving out other minorities who have been, uh, who used to be contending, you know, the Pashtun's power. While this is not true, this is just, you know, uh, 
the manipulation of the masses as they have been doing so in the past years, discrimination, injustice toward uh, the people of Afghanistan under the name of by the name of ethnicity, religious, mm. religious or any other thing cannot justify the brutality of, of Taliban's action toward the Afghan toward Afghans. Dr. Kasim, if I could interrupt you here, uh, just for the sake of time, I would like to uh, steer towards Mr. Dostiar to hear maybe his response to what you have said, uh, particularly with the view of ethno-nationalism and uh, views that you might have or insights you might have. Are there people within the Taliban and within the Pashtun community that are coming to the table and are, are interested in being in dialogue uh, with you? What are you finding, Mr. Dostiar? Yeah, thank you. I could listen to both uh, Dr. Saip and uh, Palo Shajan. Uh, and very interesting. Um, on the issue of law, um, I think that lawlessness is being used as a strategy to rule. Uh, the understanding among the Taliban is that you are on earth to fulfill certain obligations given by God. And we, as representative of God on earth, are going to enforce them. You don't need any laws because the laws that you talk about, you want to shape your surroundings, but you don't need to do anything. You are just here to fulfill a responsibility, not create change. And so that's a, a significant, uh, that's an important um, difference in the understanding um, between the different uh, factions on um, and so, and I think that that's not out of ignorance. And as Dr. Saip and Palosh John also uh, mentioned, it's a, it's a way of instrumentalizing religion and uh, what you have. And um, at the heart of it is probably a zero sum game for power and there are all kinds of grievances. And I also want to mention that other factions have also failed and, uh, and, and, uh, uh, not been united even when there was a government um, and uh, and now the challenges that we have are uh, even if Taliban do uh, come to talk who do they talk with um, there's an older generation that have lost their public trust and there's a new generation uh, uh, that has not earned anything yet because they are so new uh, and so the older generation is not accepted. The new generation is also not accepted. Then um, you are left with a gap. And that is why uh, different factions, and I heard an interesting term from Dr. Saif, he called it Tajik resistance. And so like different factions will in different places, even within an ethnic group might rise in a certain community place and defend themselves um, for whatever they believe. I've seen like um, uh, from other ethnic groups as well uh, that, uh, you know, we saw for example, the case of Balkhop, uh, a Hazara uh, leader stood up. Uh, we have seen recently among Uzbeks and in the beginning as well. And so there's not a coordinated a national um, opposition uh, against the Taliban in an armed way. And so it's a complicated um, situation. I think that uh, um, uh, I would also not divide it along um, too much along ethnic lines. I think that we do need to take into consideration issues of ideology. We have uh, lots of people among all uh, different ethnic groups who want uh, more progressive Afghanistan. Uh, we also have uh, uh, people who among uh, the different ethnic groups who would want a more uh, fundamental, they have a more fundamentalist uh, understanding of Islam. And, uh, and, and so the way I think about it is like majorly uh, four different ideologies. We have the fundamentalists, the Taliban are there, uh, Hizb Islami is there and, uh, and others. We have the conservative factions um, these are uh, former jihadi groups um, who have uh, uh, progressed. Um, uh, uh, and uh, we have the modernists, uh, a lot of the new generation. And we also have the moderates. Uh, this is the group that have not uh, joined any of the other groups, uh, any of the other three groups, uh, but probably they have also not coalesced into their own unique 
group yet. And uh, uh, I think that I would like to emphasize that uh, the issue of ideology is also very important. And uh, we, uh, as and this is why these dialogues and these discussions are important because all of these things um, will be debated, and so that we come to a clearer understanding of the situation and uh, the actors, and then think about the future. Excellent, thank you. We want to save some time for questions, so I think some people have uh, typed them into the chat, and I'd also like to invite those who are present with us here. If you have a question, uh, please indicate us and, and uh, Dean, uh, Dean Archer will come your way. Two questions online. Uh, what are the effects of the uh, healthcare system as a result of the Taliban coming to power? Are female students able to continue nursing? So a question for, I don't know if you can hear that, but what, what's the healthcare system like? Uh, and, and particularly are, uh, are there female uh, physicians and nursing students who are able to to participate? What is the situation? Is that something that you, Paul Washaji, could, could help us with, Ms. Cocker? Yeah, so a lot of, so first of all, there's a shortage because a lot of uh, professional women, including doctors and nurses, have left the country or, or are in fear of staying in the country um, and fear for their security. Uh, and those that are there and have been part of the healthcare system and are trying to go to work do so under duress, it is very difficult for them to function, although that is one of the fields where women are allowed. Um, it is quite strict in terms of where women are allowed in the hospitals and uh, how women patients are able to only see female doctors and how, you know, the, with the limitation of female doctors, how many patients are turned away at the door because there are not enough female doctors. Um, we also know that the whole NGO system uh, of clinics and, and, and regional health centers is also, um, deteriorating partially because of the financial systems within the country and the inability to pay them. Uh, so, so there's a number of issues related to healthcare uh, in terms of what I've been tracking. Um, so, you know, particularly for women trying to access healthcare, it is difficult. We have seen some interesting videos where uh, female doctors uh, have spoken out, have tried to uh, sit down with Taliban leadership to tell them how important it is for women to get an education so that there can be more female doctors, how important it is for, you know, women to be allowed to work, um, that have met with resistance uh, when those things have gotten public. So um, uh, as uh, Minister Professor Wafia Zada mentioned, these women are at the forefront of some of the really important protests that are happening in the country. Um, but of course, uh, there's a lot of crackdowns. So anybody who's involved in protests or is identified as speaking out against the Taliban, um, there's all kinds of detentions, beatings, tortures, things like that that are happening to these women. Thank you. As we wait for other questions to come up, I had one, I think Ambassador Tom West yesterday uh, announced that a significant portion, close to 50% of the Federal Reserves or the Reserve of the Afghan bank held by the U.S. are going to be released uh, primarily for macroeconomic support. But I wonder if any of you would like to comment on that, on the release of funds back to the Afghan bank that were being held by the U.S. Well, if, if I may. Yes, please. Yeah, actually, this has been, you know, the debate on that has been going on uh, for over a year. And finally, we had that decision. Uh, we uh, welcome that, that new decision that the United States government has made. Actually, what's important for Afghanistan is that currently the, the Afghanistan bank is not, uh, trans the system is, uh, is, is not transparent enough. So it is not impartial to say, and, and they don't have effective uh, control of the situation there. So if this money is given to the central bank controlled by the Taliban people, so the fears uh, we fear that it might be used for, for uh, the, you know, financing terrorism or 
or, or, or violent activities within the country to suppress you know, the civilians or any sort of uh, uh, objections in, within the country. So that's one. And second, of course, we rejected the idea that it should be transferred or distributed. And as, as the court in New York and others in the United States also rejected that idea to be given to the victims of 9-11. So they state they stand for most of Afghans has been this, that this reserve should be kept secure as part of the national wealth of, the Af of Afghanistan in a secure account so currently, I think it's going to be transferred into a bank in Swiss, Switzerland. So it should be kept secure as a the support for Afghan currency and a support for the, for the financial system of the country. But it should not be given to the Taliban to be used because there is no transparency there you, you couldn't ex expect any sort of ex uh, you know accountability from them so they can use that amount out of desperation for any purpose there is no guarantee that they will use that you know peacefully and for the purpose of of delivering services for the people excellent thank you so much we have reached the the top of the hour is there one more I just had a quick oh, question. Please, go ahead. Yeah, so I was really interested in hearing more about both Dosiara and Professor Wafizada's uh, idea for national dialogue, because it's something that stumped us, you know, how do we bring about some sort of a political and intra-Afghan dialogue? So I'd love to hear their ideas on how to bring this about. What are their, what are, what are they thinking about in terms of um, how this might come together or and how to identify, I know, uh, have you mentioned the problems uh, of the the young versus the older, uh, but I wonder if there's solutions that you have or, or ideas that you have. Yeah, if I may quickly, and I would love to continue this conversation with you, Mrs. Kokad, maybe afterward. Um, but my idea is that we need to take inclusivity um, seriously. And we do not, uh, we cannot afford to exclude anybody because they are old or because they are young. Um, therefore, all groups need to be taken into consideration. Of course, it does not mean that every single leader has to be at the table. That is why I propose that we take into consideration those four ideologies that provide us with four different ideological visions for the country. And therefore, all of those groups, representatives have to be present. For instance, if you think about political parties, we have uh, dozens of them. And therefore, you will not be able to bring all of them in one room. However, you could group them, categorize them along those four ideologies, and maybe five or six but um, or fewer. Um, uh, uh, and then they could be um, represented. Uh, the last point, before even we get there, it's very important that we also create the conditions for, uh, for dialogues. Um, unfortunately, discussions even about the, the frozen funds are going to divert uh, us from the real problem. Uh, that money is not going to um, resolve our problems. We will be in this perpetual cycle of need and debate next year. We were here last year, we will be here next year if we do not uh, start dialogue, but we need to create the conditions. And I'm happy to talk about what those conditions are. One thing that I shared earlier is um, from the international community's um, stance is that we need to um, balance our engagement so that the Taliban do not believe that they are the only power with whom the world engages, but that there are other realities on the ground as well. Thank you. Thank you. That was a very good place to draw this to a conclusion. I want to thank each of our panelists for being with us. Uh, thank you, particularly you, Dr. Wafa Yazadov. It's so early there in Japan that you've been gracious and been with us and given us your time. Uh, Mrs. Cocker, Mr. Dostyar, uh, truly a pleasure. And I think that's a good note to end on, one that there will be a next chapter. And uh, I am very interested in carrying forward this conversation. If you would like to uh, send me an email. I'm happy to direct those to people who are in our panel 
or to respond to questions that you have in light of uh, what you've heard today. Thank you. And thank all of you who have joined us today in our audience. Goodbye and farewell. Thank you. Thank you. And a big thank you to the audience.